I need to give a small brief on what, uh, where this work is done and how it came to be done. Uh, this work is done in two sites in Kenya. One is Makuen, which is on the eastern part of Kenya, and Nandi, which is in the northern Lift Valley. The two sites were selected based on a number of factors. One of the factors was, did the site have any previous uh, cases of either human aflatoxicosis before? In that case, Makueni fit in that category. <coughs> Nandi, on the other hand, did not have any human cases of, of aflatoxin. We had evidence that they had very high cases of esophageal cancers, which we knew were already associated with another toxin, not aflatoxin, but fumonesin. The other criteria was on maize growing, and we knew that Nandi was growing a lot of maize, and Makueni was maize deficient, relied mostly on imports from other, other, other parts of the country. The other criteria was for maize, uh, was for uh, dairy keeping in that in that in that uh, in that country, in that part of the of the country. Uh, our outline for this today will look at fungi and mycotoxins in general. I'll look at contamination of cereals as we did it in the two sites. Our calculated household exposure, what we consider to be the con the obstacles to the control of aflatoxin in Kenya, and what our approaches do you think would be working best. Uh, we know that mycotoxins are secondary metabolites from fungi. We know quite a number of fungi have been uh, described, and an estimated over 1.5 million is estimated that they exist but are not yet been identified. The colonizing fungi live on substrates, and as they do so, they do either they live as parasites, symbiotes, or saprophytes. They do colonize by secreting enzymes which helps them to break these complex matrices where they live so that they can get their nutrients. And in the process of this growth, they secrete these raw molecular weight compounds, which are, have toxic properties called mycotoxins. There is no agreement as to why they produce the toxins. Scientists have not come to an agreement, that, but two theories have been put forward. These are reaction against anti-insects and antirodent agents that are being used. And agri or reactions to agricultural biocides. Whatever the reason, we know the toxins are toxic and they are present when these uh, fungi grow. On the mycotoxins, we know there are between 300 and 400 different types of mycotoxins that are known today. But all of them are not very toxic, but some have got toxicities at higher concentrations and also have got significant or economic impacts in lives. One of these is aflatoxin, the one which is the subject of our, of our discussion today. We know that it's produced by a number or by quite a number of species, but more by aspergillus as a major species that produces more, to, more of this toxin, and the species mostly we are looking at in aspergillus is flavus and palaceticus. There are about 18 different aflatoxins, but the most known and with variable toxicities is B1, B2, G1, G2, M1, and M2, which are produced by this toxin, by the Aspergillus flavus. And when, the, when they grow, or when, when it grows and produces this, they fluoresce. The names B1, B2, G1, G2 is on type of fluorescence in game. But what we know is that B1 is the most toxic. Below on that slide, you find that there is a structure of aflatoxin. Uh, Catherine mentioned, uh, keep mentioned this before. I emphasize again that this is a very close structure, which shows that it's very stable, and this, uh, it can resist high temperatures of up to 260, and can be also be stable over age of pH. Therefore, this is what makes it very difficult to destroy. Also, being that toxic, then a very important toxin for us to think, to, to, be, to be worried about. But not all Aspergillus flavus produce toxin. There are some that are not toxigenic and are referred to as atoxigenic strains. Those of you who followed on the lecture by, uh, by the presentation by Katie will remember that she was mentioning about biocontrol. And in that, they were using atoxigenic strains of Aspergillus flavus. 
the toxigenic strains also differ in, uh, in, in a number of factors that are important for toxin production. One of the divisions is on the basis of, uh, of uh, uh, producing these asexual reproduction structures that are referred to as skeroshes. Those that produce a smaller type, which are less than 400 micro micromules, are mostly the S, called the S strains. And those that produce more than 400 micromules, sclerotias, are referred to as the aero strains. And these sclerotias are important because they, al they, al they allow the, the fungus to be able to survive environmental conditions and can stay in the soil for so long. The S strains, the S strains of aspergillus, are known to produce more toxins than the aero strains. I think there is a misconception that aero strains don't produce that toxin. But we know they produce as much. They can produce as much if the conditions are good. So the fact that they are toxigenic, they should still be taken very seriously. The other fact that is different in the two strains is that S L strains are very invasive as compared to S strains, and therefore they can they, if the two of them are present in the in in a, in a in a matrix, then they can be able to move fast and produce more toxins. In our study in Nandi and Makoweni we tried to take a number of samples to help us to understand a number of things. The samples we took uh, included soil, maize that we got from the households, maize that we got from the market, and also we got milk from the households, cattle milk, or cow milk, or goat milk. We also got samples of um, breast milk from breastfeeding mothers, urine from children who are below five years, and also we got um, sorghum and milk and feedstuffs from cattle and goats. So in our in our, in our now efforts to understand the differences in the uh, the, uh, the microbiota in the two sites, we're trying to isolate aspergillus from the maize. We did pass in the maize, and of these aspergillus species was highly was both more common isolated in both in both in 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 Makueni and Nandi but the isolation incidences were quite quite high which meant that uh, that aspergillus was very common in the maize in both sites and also in the soils from both places when we look at aspergillus other than aspergillus the other type of uh, fungi we isolated included uh, uh, Fusarium species were the second in line. Uh, then we had Penserium and we had Trichoderma. But when we came to Aspergillus itself, Flavus, this uh, uh, Aspergillus nigra, uh, nigra, uh, uh, section Flavi, we were able to have Aspergillus flavus more isolated in, than in, uh, in uh, Makueni at 82% more prevalent than in Nandi, we found about 58%. And the, when we looked at the scrotia formation of the strains, we found more isolates from Makueni producing more scrotia than from Nandi. And of the type that we found, in Makueni we had all strain S, which is the dose produces more scrotia, and in, in Nandi we had more of strain the L strain of Aspergillus flavus. When we put this in the growth media, because we really intended to understand more what they do, and we give them the right conditions for growth and produce toxins, the, F, the toxin A, A, B1 that was produced by this isolates from Makueni produced very high amounts of about 83,000 parts per billion. Well, the L strain that was found in mostly in Nandi produced about 60,000 parts per billion. This clearly shows you cannot forget, they say it doesn't produce much toxin. Those are levels that can cause death. On the other hand, the L strain from, from Nandi also produced G aflatoxins, which was not the case with the strains from Makweni. So that allowed us to understand the profile in those sites, that we had more L strain than S strain in Makwene. From the main samples we collected, 
both market and and and, and uh, home homegrown maize. We checked for aflatoxin using competitive fertilizer and also HPLC. In Makuen, we had very high uh, uh, contamination levels. On average, Makuen had 30 times more contaminated maize with higher amounts than in Nandi, uh, because we had a uh, we, had, we had about that one part in, in Makuen for how homegrown and nine, 0.9 ppb in Nandi, in Nandi for homegrown, which is about 30 times more contaminated in Makuen than in Nandi. But also remember the type of strains we have in the two states. For the market, we had a similar strain, strain contaminated in Makuen, in Makuen than we found the market samples in Nandi which, as I mentioned, is a reflection of the types of strains that are found in the two places. If the conditions remain as they are, those uh, strains in, Makuen, in Nandi will produce less toxin as compared to those in, Maku, in, in Makuene. We tested other cereals, and mostly we tested sorghum and millet. Uh, we tested uh, other cereals, that is millet and sorghum, and the contamination levels also follow the similar trends with higher contamination from sorghums and millets from Makueni than we, we had from Nandi. And the reason is, of course, Nandi does not grow a lot of sorghum to buy, but Makueni still they grew and it was quite uh, <coughs> contaminated. Now, one thing that the reason we chose to do sorghum and millets was that these are counted as the alternative crops that are going to allow for crop diversity, and we need them to know how contaminated they are. We know that they are also being used as baby weaning uh, formulas. Compared to West Africa, where Fatherland found that they are about 12 times less contaminated than maize, in Makueni and Nandi, they were only 1.2 times less contaminated, which is good a little, but not good enough. We need to work to not to uh, bring them up as the alternatives, and people think that they have no problems at all in terms of aflatoxin. We need to control for the aflatoxin in them also. Now, with that information, we try to calculate household exposure. I want to mention that we were not calculating individual exposure that we say in terms of so many parts per billion per kilogram body weight. We were interested to see how much is this happening in the household level. And so we looked at the food consumption for household itself and trying to calculate the consumption levels. From maize, which was highly contaminated in Makueni, we realized that there was uh, a consumption of about, uh, an average 0.18 for children below five years, 0.36 and 0.4 kilograms of mesfra consumed per day in those households or by people either six, six to 60 years and above 60 years. In terms of exposure to that household, McQueen had a higher exposure with households taking about 15 parts per billion per kilogram of flour they consume per day. And that is as opposed to Manandi where they had only four parts, per, they were taking in four parts per billion for every kilogram of flour they consume per day. Remember, each one of them is taking about 0.4 kilograms or 0.36 or 0.18. And this is quite in agreement with work done earlier by Siboe and Morioki, who found that for urban Nairobi, the consumption was about 0.4 kilograms per person per day. The household exposure did not only come from maize and maize alone, also they consumed a lot of milk. Makweni had, did not have a lot of animals, but they had some milk. On average, they were consuming about 0.3 liters per household, whereas in Nandi, they were consuming about 3.1 liters per household. Nandi produces much more milk. It's a major contributor of the milk that is, uh, that is produced in Kenya. It produces quite high amounts. And when we, we look at that, we find that for Makueni, for instance, the exposure from milk was about 10 parts per, per trillion per liter for every liter of milk we consume per day. But in Nandi was quite low, one, part per, one PPT per liter. And this is a reflection of what was also we found in animal feeds. 
they were less contaminated because they are coming from the same areas, the same maize that they were consuming, what they could not consume, they would give to us. And so that's where the, 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 the less numbers are coming from. What we consider to be obstacles to the control of aflatoxin in the two sites and possibly extrapolating to Kenya. First is lack of knowledge on the effects of contaminated maize or spelt maize they may have. In one study, we found that a lot of people, about 15%, would use spelt maize to make local alcoholic brews. And, the, and realizing that we said aflatoxin is very stable to temperatures and everything else. Even when they make the brews, then aflatoxin still remains there. So the, they trying to do that to because it's not useful in any other way, does not continue to give them an exposure. The other one is for milk. 50% of the population will use all milk that is contaminated or milk that is spoiled, not even contaminated because they don't let us got aflatoxin, but spoiled milk is used to feed animals, chicken, sheep and goats and cattle. And these people do not consider that milk being unsafe. So they will continue drinking that milk with which has got has some levels of M1 which could be coming from the feed. There's another group of people who do not know any health risks that could be associated with eating more than this. And all this, this lack of knowledge is very critical because they do not know what to do. I want to interject here and give a, a scenario of a person, an old man who told me during the, the, the dis dissemination of the results, he asked me, this aflatoxin you want us to fight against and defeat, it doesn't have a form. I was in the military. This aflatoxin does not even have a military uniform we can see and work with and fight against. How do we fight something we can't see, we don't understand? They need knowledge. It's a failure to observe good agricultural practices. In our study, we looked at various agricultural practices that they do and how they contribute to aflatoxin, or how they would contribute to aflatoxin. And we realized that 50% of the household were not using the recommended varieties which could have been resistant is a good start to the fight against aflatoxin. They're using varieties that may be very susceptible. In crop rotation or intercropping, over 60% are doing monocrop, maize after maize after maize every season. And that ex exploited cell fertility and the crops when they grow, they are weak and they become susceptible to attack by fungus. When it comes to drying, they don't use canvas a small proportion, about 16%. 50, a half of them, 51%, the threshing method is the wrong one. They use, take the cobs, put them, them in, a, in a sack and, beat, and pound them out to thresh out the grains. That con makes a lot of problems with the breaking and cracking and allowing the, if the fungal spores are there, they can easily penetrate and grow in the mess. And as I mentioned, 52%, 59%, almost 60 are using maize as animal feed. So this lack of this uh, 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 observance of these good agricultural husbandry practices is contributing to the increase in the cases of aflatoxicosis, either in humans or livestock, and needs to be capped if we have to be able to make our way ahead with the next one is the literacy levels. 62% of the people in the two sites, and we sampled about 247 uh, households, 62% had only gone to primary school level. And let me stress that we didn't check which, at which year did they exit second primary school. We asked, did you, where did you go up to primary school? Could have dropped in standard three, three years of school and not eight years. And there was a 7% who had no formal education at all. And this is critical when we consider we are dealing with a, 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 a technical topic which they need to find understanding in some areas, some, a lot, some knowledge that is necessary for them to go to be able to effective control at a household level. The stuttering uh, the statistics that have come out of the Kenya education system 
is that even those who have attained primary education, some of them, majority of them at standard eight cannot even do arithmetic that is equivalent to be done by students who have done three years of education. So you can see this 52% could actually be worse than what we think they have. The next thing that we find is poverty levels. According to the Kenya uh, demographic study of 2008, Nandi has got 29% of uh, uh, poverty, 29% uh, living below poverty level line and 64 in Mkwen. This population have no major choices. What they get, they will eat. If we can draw down that, we will put it down, you get increased, we decrease their poverty levels, then some people may have choices to make. And choice of safe food could be a good, a good choice to make. But at the moment, it may be not at the, at the table for them to consider. The other aspect we think is that there is, if we don't have, as a country, we don't have any monitoring or surveillance system that's supposed to pre-warn us when their incidences are going to be high or when where hotspots exist and how to deal with those. Those are lucky. And this may mean that we have got difficulties in how we control. Um, next, uh, what I want to look at here is I want to uh, present a, 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 a random uh, um, an, a analysis, which we did to associate various agricultural practices at pre-harvest and post-harvest and link this to what kind of a platoxin we found in the maize from those areas. And I'm not very good on this, but uh, what I was told happens, the longer it is, the more it is uh, it's away from the center, the more, the more important it is. And what we have in this uh, anal uh, redundancy analysis is that we have got two factors that are making a critical impact in analyzing, uh, giving us the differences in terms of Makweni and Nandi in the control process. Um, I want you to look at the bottom line we have got done as analysis one. That divides the, chart, the square, the, the rectangle into two with Makweni on the right and Nandi on the left. If you look at the practices that are in Makweni, they are all associated with Fumonisin 3, Afla 3. What this means is that they associated the maize in those areas, in those places, and the aflatoxin levels above 10 parts per billion, or fumonisin level above 2 parts per million. On Nandi side, we don't see any aflatoxin level 3 or fumonisin level 3. We only see fumonisin 2, Afla 2, and so on. Afla 1 and fumonisin 1, fumo 1, means that they were no detected limits. They are, no detect they are not detectable. AFLA2 and FUMO2 means it's between, between 0 and 10 for AFLA2, FUMO0 to 2 parts per million for FUMO. So that you can see in Makweni, whatever they did, even if it was good or bad, it was associated with very high level of AFLA2 as compared to Nandi. This is post-harvest post factors, what they were doing. You look at redundancy uh, analysis one, and you can see that whatever good they could do in Makweni was associated with very high levels of aflatoxin three or fumonisin beyond three, beyond two parts per billion, per million. And in Nandi, the opposite was the case, or the good things they did were with the low aflatoxin levels. Now, having said that, how do we think we need to do uh, in controlling aflatoxin so that we can provide safe food which would be able to save lives. And save lives in terms of uh, either acute aflatoxicosis or chronic aflatoxicosis, which uh, Kitty dealt with in the previous, uh, previous uh, presentation. One, we do believe that, like the old man told me, we need to uncover and unmask our enemy. And the only way we can do this is if we create awareness among the households. They are critical because they begin, that's where the problem begins. 98% of the Kenya households will plant maize. This is for their own consumption and maybe excess they will sell. The others who are planting large amounts for selling. 
But if they don't understand what we are dealing with, it will be difficult for us to control. At this point, we need to be able to create awareness along the misvalue chain. And more so to us, we think the household should be our target. The next thing that this we feel is going to, to give us uh, an edge in, in the control process is mapping out the distribution of the fungal species and aflatoxin. Because if you look at the two redundancy tables I've given, the control practices, the control measures you need to target Makueni will be totally different from the control practice, uh, 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 methods you need to target for Nandi. Makueni, you need to target pre-harvest. That's where the problem lies. Because it doesn't matter what they do, that is their problem. If you control that, you'll be able to do well. Makwe, Nandi is a post and needs to be dealt from that angle. So we need to be able to understand what do we have in all these maize growing areas? What do we need? Where do we focus our targeting technologies to control? We also believe that um, we need technologies that will be easy to adopt and adapt so that we can be able to control. I know there are very many out there, but one thing is, is clear. The more expensive the technology is, the more difficult it is for people to adopt and adapt. It doesn't matter how good it is, it will be difficult for them to do so. Especially when you are dealing with a community which is 29 and 64% below the poverty line. That decision to do that extra will be very difficult, will be very hard to make and make it to the control process other than use it the way it is. So we need good, we need to be able to select our technologies well. There are some that are very beautiful, but they cost, you are, we hear they will cost you about $5. But $5 to a household which is living under poverty line is like asking them to give you a million shillings which they don't have. You need to give something that they can do or they are doing and teach them to do it well. That's why we think good agricultural and husbandry practices at household level will be key in the control process. This is my last slide. I want to say uh, acknowledge that this project was uh, funded by Minister of Foreign Affairs Finland. I want to acknowledge our Safe Food, Safe Dairy Project team and the communities in Nandi and Makwene. We do believe that uh, this process is like this African problem, that whatever we do today may not benefit us, but will benefit those who come later and may be able to, to be able to reap those benefits. Thank you very much for listening to us. Um, we now move into a discussion time, which obviously over the web can be quite creative, particularly when we have so many people online today. So it's over to all of you to see who would like to ask questions. So I wonder if you could just explain the, the different practices you've highlighted. Uh, for example, ash or crib. I'm, I just didn't understand what exactly these practices are. Okay. Um, if you look at the graph, um, from RD A1 side, and you are seeing Makueni. What you see there is that the first practice is fast granary. What that meant is that they were storing their maize in a granary, which is a good way to store maize because granaries right. are transitory methods of, of storage. The next one is on on ground on cob. That is drying, of, drying the grains. How do they dry them? And they were drying them on the ground, but they were on cob. They are not, on the, they are not grains. The other one is harvesting manual by pounding, by harvest, uh, threshing, by make, beating the maize when it is in a sack. The next one was the raised bag. What that means is that when they were storing, they, put the, they thresh the maize, put the maize on a bag, and put it on a pallet. Crab is just like a grain. Uh, ash is a traditional method of preservation where they are adding wood ash. Chuck, after, chuck, after wood has been burned, the ash was put as a preservative in the maze. So those are some of the pre other preservations, the practices as you see. So the right is an increased risk, risk of aflatoxin and the left is a decreased risk? Yeah. Yes, yes. 
That's what it is associated with the means that came from those households that were practicing this. The aflatoxin was quite high and the other one quite low. So these are some of the ones that we were able to, to come up with. But I haven't presented all the, all the, the, other, the, other, the other graphs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I work in the field of nutrition, and I was interested that you mentioned about, uh, particularly about contamination of uh, millets and sorghums, and that you know they are used preferentially for uh, infant feeding. So I was just wondering if you know anything about uh, any other specific effects of uh, aflatoxin on infant and young child health or development. Is there do you know of information in that respect? Uh, you were asking whether we know of the effects of aflatoxin in, uh, from a nutritional point of view to ch in children. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, 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 we do. We remember I mentioned that we had um, we took some samples of uh, children, urine, and also breastfeeding mothers, which we haven't given you the data here because you're analyzing it. But one thing we know is that aflatoxins are associated with stunting in children. And we know that from our study, you know, we found that about 27% of the children were stunted in Makueni and 17 in Nandi. Uh, we are not saying that they, it's holy because of aflatoxin, but if you com compare this with what we found about those children, is that 80% of them, both in Makweni and in Nandi, had aflatoxin in their urine. We took the urine and we know they had aflatoxin. And the same children, who are, some of them who are breastfeeding, the milk we got from their mothers, about 86% in Makweni, and 90-58% of the milk from, from the breastfeeding mothers had aflatoxin M1. So there is, an, there is transfer of all these to children. We know the, the aflatoxin is responsible for stunting. We also know it, 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 it contributes to cognitive uh, reduction in cognitive development. Other than this longitudinal growth also has a problem with the wasting and other. Uh, wasting? Yeah, they do not have much mass like than, any, than the others. They are, they are not on the same weight. Yeah, I was interested to know, um, did you be, were you able to ascertain whether sort of um, um, spoiled maize tended to be eaten by adults and less so by young children, i.e. did they save the best maize for young children? And with the milk um, from animals, is there any way you can tell that the milk is less good, or is it just the same as any other milk as far as the, the households are done? Okay, yeah, um, on maize, there, is, there wasn't any decision on which milk, either the maize should be selected and the good one goes to the children or goes to the, the parents, no. What we found is that young children below five years, uh, especially in when and Nandi, in Nandi they were introduced to diets which were made of maize very early before they were about even five months. And those in, in Makweni, they were a little bit later, they were on sorghum and millet, and when they were about one year, they would then get into maize, uh, maize diets. So in terms of a selection by the households to uh, say this goes to children, no. They eat from the same pot and they eat whatever is provided for. In terms of milk, there isn't any way you can tell whether this milk is contaminated or not. Milk is milk. That's why this old man told me after toxin has got no form. It has got no yeah. enemy, it has got no uniform. We can't see it like you do when you're in the army, you know he's wearing that, and that uniform belongs to uh, this army or the other. And if I may yeah. add something to that, you know, regarding milk, we know that as aflatoxins are very heat stable, even if you boil or pasteurize milk, the aflatoxins are not uh, degraded or inactivated. So they remain still active there, and uh, this is something also that the consumers do not know. So there's a need for education also regarding, regarding that fact. Time, okay. Um, 
our interest, let me say, was not to look at the period uh, relationship to this. Uh, we wanted to look at what is the household exposure like. And when we did this work, we did it, we collected the samples in uh, November, November, De November, December, which in Makueni is um, almost two months after planting and uh, maybe about, about five months after harvesting. In, in Nandi, it's almost the same because they will harvest from August also. So it was sometimes after, after a long period of harvest during the time when the maize was very young in the, in the, after planting. But we weren't very much looking at the seasonalities and how they affect the contamination levels, no. But we do know that there are differences in the contamination levels depending on when, what time when you sample. If you sample immediately after harvest, maybe you don't get very high levels, but as they keep on storage, then the buildup of alpha toxin during the storage, you find very high levels. This may be what we are seeing in our case because we collected very much later. At that time, for instance, in Makueni, they will not be having maize. They will be relying on maize from outside, the, outside Makueni to be brought in. And that would also depend on where the meat was grown and how it was stored and also in their storage, how it is kept. So we do know the time effects also may have played a part, but we didn't go out to look for that. Okay, I never said there is a method that costs $5. What I gave was an example that if we have any method that somebody may say it costs $5 or costs $10 or whatever the figure is, what I'm, I was trying to say is that the cost of the technology to use will determine whether the poor households can afford. Because $5 to somebody in, in the U.S. would mean very little money compared to what $5 is to a, to a household which is less below poverty line in Makwene. So it wasn't a technology at all that cost five, $5. I'm sorry about if you just misunderstood me. What I want, wanted to mention is that even if a, te te a technology is cheap, let's look at what that cheap means to a household which is living below poverty line. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think you'll agree that this has been a fascinating presentation. So I'd like to uh, thank, and here we go again as I massacre your name, uh, Professor Hangete and Professor Kohonen for being with us this afternoon. I'm not sure we've firmed up the actual date, but I think within the next month, Celia will be uh, following up with another presentation in this area. So you'll be welcome to join us for that. Um, and we're still working on our proposal in terms of the conference in September. So thank you very much, and thank you, everybody. And I look forward to meeting and the next webinar with you all.